I used to work for Youth to Youth for a long time, and in my early uh, 20s, uh, Cayman Islands Youth to Youth needed a, uh, needed a program coordinator. And you know, I'm young, I'm single, I'm like, okay, I'll go, right? I'll be the sacrificial lamb, right? <laughs> And so I moved to the Cayman Islands uh, in, in um, uh, what was that, 1994 or something like that, and then ended up staying there for uh, about six years running their youth to youth program uh, down there. It was interesting, my, my business card said uh, National Youth Programs Coordinator, right? I was like, wow, that's a lofty title, you know? You gotta give it context though. If you're familiar with the Cayman Islands, 21 square miles, um, about 45,000 people um, live there. Now, I always say, like, if, if I was the National Youth Programs Coordinator for the United States, that might be, you know, a big deal. I'd be living in Washington, private jets all over the country or whatever. Being the National Youth Programs Coordinator for the Cayman Islands meant I had an extra set of keys to the high school gymnasium, right? <laughs> You wanted to borrow the national snow cone machine, you had to go through me, okay? <laughs> um, but I, I, I love my time there, and, and I love what I get to do now, which is I have a company called Reach Communications, Reaching Excellence in Attitude, Character, and Health. And we're basically a health and wellness marketing firm. So all our campaigns are focused on health and wellness, particularly for our most vulnerable populations and disenfranchised uh, communities. So like right now, you know, we're doing a campaign in New Jersey about risky sexual behavior. We're doing a foster care campaign for the state of California. We're doing a lot of SIDS work and tobacco work in uh, Louisiana. And then in Ohio, uh, what's really cool is the work we're doing now, which is the Be Present campaign. We've actually been doing it for about uh, three years now, uh, and we're just now launching it. It was in its developmental stages for the first two uh, years or so, and we're starting to launch the campaign, and we're really excited about it. Uh, aside from this campaign, which is a really a mental health and wellness and suicide prevention campaign, started uh, by young people, for young people in the state of Ohio, which is so cool. I love that. Young people support what they feel like they've helped create, and, and so this has all come from them. And and we were just help, able to help kind of guide them along the way as they develop this campaign. But aside from this campaign, we're also working on a suicide prevention campaign for veterans uh, that's aimed at their uh, families called Families for Vets. You'll hear about that. That's a statewide campaign that'll be uh, coming out soon. And we're also doing uh, work in uh, tobacco um, uh, prevention and, and opioid work. So uh, love when I get to stay home and work in the state that means the most to me. Um, and uh, so, like I said, the campaign started, uh, or the idea for the campaign started about two and a half years ago. Um, I met with about 20 young people from across the state of Ohio. And basically, uh, I, at that time, I, I, um, I was just there to listen. A lot of times I'm invited into schools and communities to talk, and at this time it was just my turn to listen. Listen to them, listen to what their needs were. And what they share with me is what I hear all the time, what we hear all the time. Young people um, in the 21st century are experiencing higher levels of stress, depression, anxiety, and fear uh, than, than ever before. And if you look at some of the roots of it, I've got some theories and ideas. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there. What I believe one of the, uh, one of the biggest contributors is, is um, Previous generations of parents and adults, period, uh, did everything they could to minimize risk and uncertainty in their children's lives. They did everything they possibly could to minimize risk and uncertainty. Hear what I'm saying, minimize it. What we have done as parents, including myself, I have an 18-year-old son and a 14-year-old daughter, we have done everything we can to eliminate risk and uncertainty in our children's lives to their detriment. Risk and uncertainty is a healthy thing. It helps you problem solve. It helps you deal with uh, failure uh, and cope in positive ways. I remember, now this is a story that like blows my mind to even imagine because I can't imagine doing the same thing for my two children. Uh, I'm from Columbus, born and raised here like I said, and grew up on the hilltop which is the west side which is a very, uh, at that time in the 80s was high drug, high violence, high crime. I got shot in the 10th grade. A lot of crazy stuff happened to me. And then in high school, we moved out to the Near East Side, um, which in terms of the environment wasn't much better. But um, 
Uh, I remember when I was in the seventh grade, seventh grade, so what I was, 12 years old, 12, 13 years old, me and two of my friends, our parents gave us $20, it was the summertime, gave us $20 to uh, go to the fair. What did that mean to go to the Ohio State Fair? We had to get on a bus, catch a bus downtown and then catch another bus uh, to, to get to the fair. We got there about nine o'clock that morning, we paid our money to get in, $5, got you in the fair, got you all the rides for free at that time. We, go, we got there, we all had our $20. You had to walk through the games to get to the midway to where the rides were. We didn't make it to the rides. By 10.30, 11 o'clock, all of us were completely broke. We had spent all our money on the games, right? With nothing to show for it too, by the way. We didn't have we didn't anything. So 21st century, if that happens now, what do we do? Text. We text mom, text dad, I don't have any money, can you send money back to, to my account so I can get more money or whatever? Immediately text message. We didn't have phones. We didn't have any quarters for uh, the cell f- or the, for the pay phone either. And if, they, if we did call, what would they tell us to do? Because we were supposed to stay there till 9 o'clock that night till my mom was picking all three of us up. So what did we do? We figured it out. We problem solved. We literally stayed there from 9 o'clock that morning till 9 o'clock that night. We drank water from water fountains all day long. And the, um, they happened, luckily, it, do y'all remember Kudos? Those like chocolate covered granola bars or whatever. Kudos had just came out and they had booths set up all over the fair where they were giving away free samples. We literally lived off water and Kudos all day long. We didn't want to go home. We wanted to stay and have a good time, and we figured it out in the seventh grade. We just problem solved. Mom picked us up at nine o'clock, and you know we didn't tell her that we because I didn't want to tell her. I thought we would get in trouble. I was fed. I just was fed on junk all day. Well, water's good for you, right? Oh, I, no, we um, we were in a fun house and. One of my friends, he found a dollar in the fun house and we literally bought uh, like a 32 ounce lemonade. So that was the only splurge we did that day. We shared this 32 ounce lemonade. But we problem solved and we figured it out. I have an 18 year old, I have a 14 year old. I can't imagine letting them go to the fair all day without checking in every hour where they're at, how they're doing in high school, right? We did it in middle school. My parents did everything they could to minimize risk and uncertainty. We do everything we can to eliminate risk and uncertainty to our children's detriment. What changed? What happened? Here's what we now have that they didn't have, 24-hour news cycle, right? Where all day, every day for 24 hours a day, we are bombarded with uh, fear-inducing information, right? 20 years ago, 30 years ago, we didn't hear about the murder that happened in some small town in, in some faraway state, the one murder that happened. But because you have to fill 24-hour news cycles, every murder, every rape, every kidnapping, every crime gets reported to us from everywhere. And so the perception is it's happening more frequently all the time. No, it's just more reported than it's ever been reported. 24-hour news cycle and, 24, and the internet, right? changed everything. 9-11 changed everything. All these things changed everything to now we are set out to eliminate risk and uncertainty. Let's baby proof our entire houses, make sure there's no sharp edges. Uh, You know, let's make sure everybody gets a participation award and a trophy and gets a snack and and let's make sure everybody knows how special they are. Right? I tell young people, if you invite me to speak in your school and in your community, your young people will hear this. Every single one of you are valuable. Not a single one of you are special. You are valuable, but you are not special. Special in the sense that you deserve special treatment because if everybody in here is special, then everybody out there is special. And if everybody everywhere is special, I don't care what Barney and Disney and your kindergarten teacher told you, you are not special. Because if everybody's special, then none of us are special. It cancels itself out. You don't want people giving you opportunities because they think you're special. You want people giving you opportunities because they recognize your value. They recognize your worth. And you have to put in work every day to prove your worth. And life sucks and it's not fair, right? Life can suck sometimes and it's not fair. So you will see people get special treatment all throughout your life. My daughter just went through this. She just went, uh, started freshman year of high school. Last spring she was nominated by by her principal to be part of some uh, leadership program that was a really big deal in in the city of Columbus. Um, 
and uh, she worked really hard to um, get into this program. She, uh, for two weeks, she, she had to do an essay, like a college level style essay, and she had to fill out an application. She had to get two references uh, from adults and uh, teacher and all this stuff. And she worked for like two and a half weeks on this thing, um, going crazy. Trying, she was so excited that she was nominated and she was so nervous about getting in, right? Turned it in a day late, uh, day early. Her and one of her best friends were nominated. She went to her friend after she turned it in to her guidance counselor. Said, did you turn your application for the leadership uh, program in? No, no. Why not? I don't know. I don't want to be, I didn't, um, I'm all right. Please, 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 please turn your application in because if we both get in, we can be in it together. Begged her to turn it in. She went home that night, wrote her essay, filled out her application, got her, uh, got her, um, References turned it in the day it was due. Uh, week went by. They both got notifications. Which one got into the program? wasn't my wasn't my daughter. She was heartbroken, devastated. Went to school. Her friend runs up to. Did you get in? No, I didn't. Did you? Yeah, I got in. Wait, how did you? You didn't even take it. Sit. Well, my mom knew the director. Da 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 da. da. Right? Special treatment. Right? She was, you know, for the first, you know, for those first few days, I had to, I just had to be dad. I could have gone into speaker trainer mode and explained to her. I said, no, you cry, you be, you're allowed to feel, feel, feel the anger, feel the frustration, feel the sad, feel it. Oh, you know, it's fine. Right. But what do we know? What do I know? My daughter wrote a college level essay in the eighth grade. She worked out some muscles she didn't even uh, know uh, needed to be worked out. So come time her junior, senior year, when she has to write an essay again, oh, I've been down this road before, right? Her friend uh, may or may not have worked out as hard as she did because she got some extra help because she was special, right? So um, young people from across the state of Ohio came together, 20 of them, and said, you know, we're struggling. We're struggling with this fear of failure, this pressure to perform, right? And it was interesting because around the same time that I met with them, I had just uh, done work in a high school, had been in this school for about a week, a private school, working with their seniors. And uh, prior to m meeting and talking to them and working with them for a week on how to pursue your passion and discover your purpose, you know, because I've written this book from this moment on um, and, and about pursuing your passion and discovering your purpose, you know, uh, two of the biggest questions we ask ourselves is who am I and why am I? And so I'm there doing this work and the, prior to going, spoke to the administration, the principal says, you know, we got rid of class rankings for our seniors. A lot of schools in Ohio are starting to do that, and actually across the state, and he said, let me tell you why we got rid of them. Our highest ranking senior has a 4.5 GPA. Our lowest ranking senior has a 4.2. It makes no sense to rank these students top to bottom, uh, you know, first to last or whatever. He said, however, the level of stress and anxiety and depression and fear of failure that they experience is off the charts. And, and, and you know, some of them are making bad un, or, or unhealthy choices as a way to cope with this stress, anxiety, depression, you know, abusing alcohol and other drugs and prescription pills, you know, and, and engaging in self-harm or even attempted or contemplating or attempting uh, to complete suicides. We're struggling. I had a young, uh, senior varsity ba basketball player, young man come up to me halfway through the week. He said, you're telling us to pursue our passion and discover our purpose. And, and, and it, by the way, when he came up to me, he was like shaking and in tears, shaking and in tears. And he said, I don't know how to tell my parents that I don't want to go to Harvard to study law, that I want to be an elementary school teacher. I'm scared to death to tell my parents so much no, so that he was, you know, like I said, shaking. He was like having a panic attack because he didn't know how to tell his parents. They literally had to sit him down with his counselors, with the principal and do like an intervention. And so he could come out of the closet and tell his parents he wanted to be an elementary school teacher. Right. Because we as a culture push this um, th this pressure to be successful. And the only version of success that we acknowledge is success on paper, right? The money, the power, the fame, the status, the stuff, the credentials, the trophies, the certificates, all the letters behind our name. On paper, this young man was extremely successful, right? Um, but he wasn't thriving. 
Just because you're successful on paper does not guarantee you're thriving. However, if a young person is thriving, and we'll talk a little bit about that, what it means to thrive and how to thrive, if you're thriving, it pretty much guarantees you're going to experience measurable successes. But we have it all backwards, right? We push the success at any and all costs. And the cost is our young people and, and adults, us as adults and young people's mental health and wellness. The cost can be our very lives. And we have to ask ourselves, and what these young people that I've met with said, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. And so what do we do new, different, and better? So they created this campaign called the Be Present Ohio campaign. And they call it the Be Present Ohio campaign, and it's supported by Ohio Mental Health and Addiction Services. Like, the state is so excited about this campaign. They said, We're, we are going to support you as much as possible, and they've taken, uh, taken it on. And, they're, and the state of Ohio is in this for the long, long haul because they understand the value of mental health and wellness and how all, lake, all boats on the lake will rise if we make uh, mental health and wellness, if we make positive coping and thriving, teaching young people positive coping and thriving skills a priority, right? How do we cope with stress and trauma in the moment? How do we learn to cope and thrive in the midst of our ongoing stress and trauma? Because there's no guarantee that our home life will change, our community life will change, our school life will change. We can't guarantee that can change. What we can change is how we respond to it. And that's what the Be Present campaign is teaching young people. We call it their respond ability, their ability to respond in new, different, and better ways to their uh, circumstances and situations, right? Teaching them how to be present. What does it mean to be present? Our mind spends most of its time in three different areas. What has happened in the past, what might happen in the future, your imagination can be your best friend or your worst enemy, or what could be happening somewhere else. I'm sure uh, the speaker earlier talked about, you know, I know it was a lot about social media and cell phones and, you know, FOMO is a, is a trend, you know, fear of missing out, right? And that's why, one of the many reasons why we're so addicted to our phones, because we're so afraid of what's going on where we are not, right? Um, so we got to check in and see what's happening, who's doing what. You know, I'm sure they talked about earlier, the more time you spend on your phones and on social media, the higher levels of stress and depression and anxiety that we experience. Why? Because one of the keys to living a miserable life is comparing your life to someone else's, right? Comparison is the key to misery. You want to be miserable? Real easy. Just compare your life to someone else's. And be mindful of... Um, this generation is the most advertised to generation in the history of the world. No one sees more commercials in a day than young people in the United States. Radio, TV, internet, billboards, magazines, cell phones, iPhones, iPods, iPads, all day, every day. Somebody's trying to sell them something. Particularly their food, fashion, health and beauty products and entertainment, right? And the people that are in that business, I understand marketing, I know what their number one goal is, is to make them feel miserable about themselves. Even adult, like we're not, we're not exempt from this. It's, it's how our, our economy is a consumption, an overconsumption driven economy, right? And so, uh, you know, there's this push to overconsume. Remember when we were recovering from 9-11, uh, what did our president stand at the podium in front of the entire world and, and challenge us and charge us to do? He didn't challenge us and charge us to serve one another. He didn't challenge us and charge us to, you know, re remember our faith and remember our family and, and, you know, remember our community. He stood in front of a microphone in front of the entire world and said, either buy, 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 or spend, spend, spend. I can't remember one of those two, but that's a direct quote. He said one of those two things. We are a consumption-driven culture, right? Especially their food, fashion, health, and beauty products, and entertainment. And, um, you know, they are told 500 to 5,000 times a day through advertisements that they are less than, right? That they are not enough. Something's wrong with the way you look, the way you're dressed, the way you're shaped, the way your shoes are, your hair is, your skin is. Something's wrong with you because you're not listening to this music and going to see these movies. You are less than. We can fix you if you buy our stuff. How much money do you think young people in the United States spend every year on those four things? Food, fashion, health, and beauty products, and entertainment. How much? Bi 10 billion? Hi 50 billion? A hundred billion? Golly. It's actually a hundred and twenty billion dollars. A hundred and twenty billion dollars a year on food, fashion, health and beauty products and entertainment. All in an effort to feel, to stop feeling less than. 
Now, I don't tell young people to, you know, throw away their name brand clothes and stop going to see their movies and music or whatever. You know, it's just we need to be critically conscious about why we make the choices that we make. Comparison is the key to misery. When, if you're honest with yourself, even us as adults, a lot of the time we spend on social media is spent comparing our life to somebody else's. How many likes did they get? How many likes did I get? How many followers they got? How many followers I got? Where are they at? Where am I at? What are they doing? What am I doing? Who are they with? Who am I with? What are they wearing? What am I wearing? Right? And, you know, why, that's why we got to take, it takes 20 different poses from 20 different angles and using 20 different filters to get the picture, right? Uh, and then we post it and then we go back and check and recheck to see, well, you know, and, and does, does, every, does the world accept me, right? And, and, and so, and again, we, we suffer from that too, adults. Don't act like we don't do it, uh, you know, when we're on Facebook or MySpace, I don't know, whatever, right? Um, so this comparison is, uh, is a key, key to me, this mindset that I have to be successful on paper to be accepted, uh, to be noticed, to be valued. Um, so I had that, I, you know, had that experience with the young man with the four point whatever GPA that was successful on paper, wasn't thriving, but then I've been in communities and talked to young people who are just, when it comes to you know, uh, fear of failure, you know, it's, I'm trying to figure out how to get to school, back and forth to school without getting shot. I'm trying to figure out how to get, feed myself and my little brothers and sisters. I'm trying to figure out where my mom is because I haven't seen her in three days, right? So what I figured out, what I found out from meeting with these 20 young people and then traveling all over this, the state of Ohio for about a year is everybody's going through something. And a lot of times, more times than not, they feel like they're going through it alone. We're more technologically connected than we've ever been, but we're more emotionally disconnected from others than we've ever been as well. And so these young people wanted to start the campaign um, and call it Be Present because our minds spend the, their time in those three places, what might, has happened in the past. Young people feel like because of their past mistakes, their past regrets, their past hurtful experiences that weren't even their fault, that they are disqualified, right? And this is what we figured out, is that the two barriers to change for an individual, since we, uh, number one, the number one barrier to change is I am disqualified. My past has disqualified me. My family has disqualified me. My neighborhood, my school, the color of my skin has disqualified me. I am disqualified from doing new, different, or better, right? And if you can instill or restore hope in a young person, even then, they still feel unqualified, which is the second barrier to change. Okay, I have hope. I believe I can. I do deserve new, different, and better. I still feel unqualified. I feel like I don't have the skills. I don't have the tools. I don't have the resources. I don't know how to do new, different, and better. I'm unqualified, right? And so, whether... and having a past that makes you feel like you're disqualified, that was a big part of my struggle as a young person. And it wasn't until I got connected with a caring adult um, in, in my school and then, you know, it was just so, like I mentioned, Columbus City Schools, Recreation and Parks, Youth to Youth, like these caring adults that helped me understand that my past had not, did not disqualify me from my future. And one of them gave me an analogy. He said, life is like driving a car. When you drive a car, you know the windshield is a lot bigger than the rear view mirror. Why? Because what's behind you is not as important as what's in front of you and down the road from you. If you spend your whole time driving a car looking in the rear view mirror, you crash that car. If you spend your whole time going through life looking at your past mistakes and regrets and hurtful experiences, you will crash in life. What you can focus on is what's in front of you and down the road from you. And what's in front of you is opportunity to do new, different, or better. I never forgot it, right? And um, and so that's the one I struggle with. What has happened in the past, what might happen in the future. Fear of the future. We freak out about the future for the same reason that we freak out about the dark. Being afraid of the dark and being afraid of the future is really a being afraid of the unknown. Right? And we as caring adults sometimes re, uh, you know, we, we even, you know, in an attempt to care, we can... Um, we, we, we can instill that fear of future, uh, the future in our young people as parents and caring adults. Here's one way we do it with a question that I bet every adult in here has asked a child at some point. You may guess what that question is? 
What do you want to be when you grow up? I don't like that question. I don't use that question. A couple reasons why I don't like that question. Number one, when you say, what do you want to be when you grow up? Really, all we're asking is, what are you going to do to make money? How are you going to make a living? How are you going to make an income? Hopefully, when it comes to your identity, there is so much more to who you are besides how you earn an income. I'm not as interested in what young people are doing to make a living as, what, as I am as, uh, in what they're doing to make a life for themselves. Because just because you make a living doesn't mean you're made a life for yourself. But if you focus on making a life for yourself, chances are you're going to figure out how to make a living along the way. Right? And so that's what the Be Present campaign is about. How teaching young, young people, teaching other young people how to make a life for themselves. How to live above the circumstances. Right? And, and, and so, but again, going back to what is success, what does the meaning of success mean? Success means money. Success means position. Success means power. So we are constantly asking them, what do you want to be when you grow up when we really just care about what they're doing to make an income? The other reason why I don't like that question is when you say, what do you want to be when you grow up? What does that insinuate? They're not anything right now. You can't be or do anything significant with your life until you grow up, right? And what do we do when they complain? What do we do when they come to us about what they're struggling with and stressed out about and what they're going through? What do we say? Ah, wait until you grow up and experience the what? Real, Real world. Do you hear how toxic that is and how dangerous that statement is? Wait till you experience the real world and how dismissive of what they're going through right there in that moment is? When, you, when we say they're apparent, you're not going through anything real right now it's all in your head right we got to be mindful of that How, um, and, and and so that fear of the future fear of the unknown right um, what has happened in the past what might happen in the future what could be happening somewhere else and if your mind is constantly in those three places your mind is not on what is happening right now which is really the only thing we can control and manage is what's happening in this moment, in the present, right? So teaching young people how to be present for themselves so that they can be present for their friends, their classmates, their siblings. Um, that's what the campaign is, is really all about. So um, how do, where does the campaign live? A lot of it lives on, online via social media. Uh, please, 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 today, before you go to lunch, I charge you and I challenge you to get on your favorite social media. I see young people in the room, that's dope. Um, you know, go to Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, whatever your favorite social media is, and just do a search for the campaign, at Be Present Ohio, and then follow the campaign and get connected to it. What happens, what the online experience is, is um, one of the first things you're gonna see is it's, you're gonna, your timeline will start to be po populated with positive messages, encouraging messages, messages on how to thrive in the midst of your circumstances, right? And a lot of these messages are coming from young people uh, throughout the state of Ohio that are already joined the campaign or active participants. You'll see videos that young people sharing their stories about how they're living above the circumstances, how they're learning to cope and thrive in the midst of their struggles. And then the more engaged and active you become in the campaign, um, you can start to share uh, uh, your stories, young people. Uh, that's the goal, is to create this community of care throughout the state of Ohio, where we're sharing our, our stories, and we're also sharing resources that are available in our state for wherever your community is. If you go on the website, bepresentohio.org, um, and you put in your zip code, it's going to come up with, it's going to give you a whole list of resources that are right there, available and accessible in your community for <laughs> for young people and, and for the adults that work with young people uh, um, that, that are available um, uh, in your community that are promoting or supporting or, or providing resources around mental health and wellness. So um, we're really excited uh, about that aspect as well. CDC, Center for Disease Control, they're on the advisory board, Nationwide Children's Hospital, Ohio State University, I think the University of Cincinnati, uh, Colorado School of Public Health, it's all being thoroughly evaluated and tested. Like the CDC, they came and asked, can we be part of the advisory board? Because we've never seen a state do what the state of Ohio is attempting to do with mental health and wellness for young people. And if you all get this right, which all 
things in, indicate that you will if you do it exactly the way you're laying it out. If you all get this right uh, in Ohio, we have to find a way to take this thing across the country. Um, they are so uh, excited about the steps that Ohio is taking uh, to prevent suicides among young people, but also raise the level of mental health and wellness uh, um, for them as well. We as adults, we have to live this before we give it, okay? That's why I gave you these, these handouts, the, uh, you know, I don't, if I don't take care of me, then I can't take care of them, and I want to get into that real quick, but we as adults have to learn to live this before we give this, right? I'll prove it right now. Everybody hold your, hold this okay sign up. Hold this okay sign up. Everybody got this up in the air? Cool. Go ahead and put that right on your chin. Put it right on your chin. On your chin. Your chin. Your chin. Chins. There we go. Where did everybody put it? On the chin. Why'd you put it there? Because you follow me. It doesn't matter what I say. It matters what I do. We have to walk the walk if we're going to talk the talk. Right? And that's why she's like, what is going on? <laughs> That's why, here's the thing, when I come and share this information with adults, because there's three levels to the campaign, signing up, uh, you know, connecting with them online, the social media, you know, you become a campaign supporter, but you can also, and what I would encourage you to do, especially the young people in the audience, go to Be Present Ohio and the adults in the audience, go be, to BePresentOhio.org and sign up to become a campaign friend. And, you know, that's when you give your, you know, your, your contact information and we'll send you updates because what we'll, we're doing is traveling around the state doing offline trainings for young people on how to be present for yourself. They're going to learn mental uh, health first aid and other things, how to be present for yourself. And then the goal is to, for them to go from being campaign friends to becoming campaign advocates and leaders where they are able, and, and the, again, the state is supporting this and funding it, where they'll uh, take them all over the state to do presentations and events and programs. Uh, in their communities and in other communities, right? But 75% of the, the engagement that young people have with the campaign is learning how to be present for themselves. Is the, because you got to live it before you give it. And, at, and, and without fail, when I travel around the state and I'm talking to particularly adults, that, especially adults that work with young people, I always get one or two that'll come up to me afterwards and say, I have a, I'm, I got some kids that would be perfect to be campaign advocates and campaign leaders. And they want to skip the steps. They want to get them out there because, again, they've demonstrated success on paper. They're their most articulate young people. They're the ones that are stand, taking all, volunteering to do all the work and taking on the heavy loads and really stepping out and, and, and you know, uh, doing uh, a, what appears to be really cool things for themselves. And, but... Even our, uh, even our strongest young people that are engaged in our work still struggle with stress, depression, and anxiety and fear of the future. This isn't like a tobacco prevention campaign or, or a substance abuse prevention campaign where you know, it's real easy to show that you're doing what the campaign requires. I'm not drinking. I'm not smoking. I'm not getting high. That's easy to show. This one, sometimes it's beneath the surface. So we, even, the, even our strongest leadership young people need to learn how to cope and thrive in positive, healthy ways. So most of uh, what the campaign is about is be learning how to be present for yourself so that you can start to be present for your friends and classmates and siblings. We recognize that mental health issues start way before high school, um, but just the way the state is unrolling it, they're starting with high school and college age students and then working their, eventually working their way back. Well, you know, and some of the, some of the um, conversations about that was, you, you've got to pick your audience. If you, if you, when it comes to like the materials and, and, and the trainings and all of these, if you, if you include middle schoolers, there's a chance, pretty good chance that high schoolers and college age students will opt out because they'll say, oh, this isn't for us. This is for some corny middle schoolers. You know what I'm saying? But if you create it and make it appealing to high schoolers and college age students, middle schoolers will opt in. You know, so all this stuff is accessible to them in terms of the resources and the videos and the social media stuff. They can access this stuff. They'll opt in because they're like cool high schooler. They want to do it cool high schooler. And Bringing Be Present, it's not a curriculum. It's not, uh, you know, extra work that you all have to do. We come in, the state provides the resources for us to come in and do all the trainings. It's really a supplement to what you're already doing. It's not an add-on. 
You know, it enhances the work that you're already doing because, again, we're teaching those young people that you're already working with how to thrive and how to be present for themselves. Everything is online, like all the resources, even though it's an Ohio-based campaign, the information and the resources are available to anyone in the world um, in terms of accessing it. Um, uh, but extra support um, in terms of like trainings or workshops or programs or presentations, of course, that is limited to uh, the state of Ohio. My company, we're f what my company, uh, you know, we're a marketing firm. We're really good at creating, you know, flashy, cool, engaging, relevant material, but it had to be backed up by science. We have to get the science right, the research right. You do well when you do right. And so, you know, it's been two years of, uh, of you know, CDC, Ohio State, Nationwide Children's Hospital, Colorado School of Public Health, shredding our stuff and dissecting it and ripping it up and then taking it to young people as well because it still has to be engaging and relevant and cool to them. So it's been two years of them shredding it and ripping it to pieces and putting it back together. And it's just now, uh, we just launched the campaign uh, last spring. The goal is to be 10,000 strong by the end of the school year. That's what they're calling it, 10,000 strong. 10,000 young people connected to the campaign via the social media. And then uh, over time, uh, about a thousand, you know, fifteen hundred to two thousand young people that are get extra offline training to become campaign advocates, and then even from there, uh, about one hundred and fifty to two hundred young people that become campaign leaders that we can engage in and call on to travel around the state of Ohio and do these presentations and workshops and events. And um, like I said, Ohio Mental Health and Addiction Services—they're in it for the long haul. They're uh, so for the foreseeable future. Now we know. You know, um, uh, you know, when when um, leadership changes in the state of Ohio, you know they can shift and go different directions. But they've been really aggressively sh working in that space to shore up the um, and, and to make sure that no matter who's in leadership, that this thing continues for as long as possible. The development of the young people is the prevention, right? Dev is prev, is short. Development of the young people, giving them opportunities to be in leadership uh, positions, giving them opportunity to take ownership of the campaign and responsibility for its success, that's the prevention. That's, the, that's what creates the leaders that they are becoming right now. Uh, which is, by the way, how do we reframe that question? It's not, what do you want to be when you grow up? It's who and what are you becoming right now? That's how you reframe that question. Who and what are you becoming right now in terms of your attitude, your actions, and your aspirations. Not just aspirations, not just dreams and goals, but your attitude and actions as well. What are you becoming better at? What are you becoming more of in terms of your attitude, actions, and your aspirations? And if you are becoming an engineer, if you are becoming a veterinarian, a teacher, a law enforcement officer, it's not, I want to be a law enforcement officer when I grow up. I want to be a teacher when I grow up. It's, I am becoming a veterinarian right now. I'm becoming a veterinarian right now. I'm becoming an engineer right now. So then the whole conversation changes and the context changes. When you say, I want to be when I grow up, it gives you permission to procrastinate. If I'm becoming a veterinarian right now, every choice I make right now matters, right? Biology matters a little bit more. Science classes, math classes, health classes, all these things matter a little bit more. And a young person can change their mind a thousand times between today and you know when they go off to college or whatever. Um, and that's okay too. But it's, I am becoming a insert here right now. Super quickly, how to thrive. Young people, and this comes from research we did with about 2,000 young people all over the country uh, in five different cities, uh, Chicago, Philadelphia, DC, Oakland, and Richmond, California. Uh, these are young people that experience high levels of stress and trauma every single day. And we found out, found that about out of those 2,000 young people, about 15% of them were actually thriving in the midst of their trauma, in the midst of their stress and, and, and you know, these circumstances. And so we look for consistencies. We didn't discover anything new. The, what we found was, had already been discovered. We just packaged it in a nice, nice, tight, clean way. And what we found was they all had these four things in common. Somewhere, a significant connection to somewhere, somehow, something, and someone. I love alliteration. Somewhere, somehow, something, and someone. I'll break that down for you super quickly. Somewhere is what we already talked about, hope. Hope for tomorrow. 
goals and aspirations, dreams, belief that things can get better. I'm going somewhere beyond where I'm at right now. And I can get there. Think about it super quickly. What is a bucket list? What we want to do before we die. What age group typically has them? Adults, middle age, you know, people with more years behind them than they have in front of them. And what do we put on our bucket list? Travel, Travel running marathons, jumping out of planes, climbing mountains, extreme behavior. Extreme behavior because we believe the end is near. So now think about the behavior of young people with no hope. They're not jumping out of planes, they're dropping out of school, they're not running marathons, they run the streets, they're not getting high on a mountain, they're getting high on alcohol and other drugs. Extreme behavior because I have no hope and I believe the end is near. And if I believe the end is near, I'm going to do what feels good right now in this moment. So when you look at it through that lens, their extreme behavior makes total sense. They should be doing those things if they believe the end is near. Right? And so we have to add hope to their lives. How do we add hope? Golly. Um, young, uh, young people have hope when they have a... Uh, Three things, alliteration really quickly. Uh, connection, competency, and contribution gives you hope. Connection to others. We are wired to work together. We are a communal species. We are wired to work together. There's no such thing as a self-made man or woman. Did you have right. a TED Talk yet? Two. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but um, the other one, the video production was awful, so you'll never oh, see it. Um, but um, connection to others gives you hope competency, a level of skill in some area, whether it's, you know, cutting uh, hair or building a computer or, or fixing a car or, 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 but the two competencies that are most important, number one is how to cope. Cope is a competency. Having uh, coping skills, positive coping and thriving skills, that's an area of competency. And how to navigate systems, learning how to access resources and navigate systems is a competency. And you feel hope when you feel like you are skilled in some area. Connection, competency, and contribution. When I'm able to give back and I'm living for more than myself, right? And have a connection to something bigger than myself. Gives you hope, right? So, somewhere is hope, beliefs, uh, dreams, goals, aspirations. Somehow is a plan or a strategy on how to get where I'm trying to go. A track that we're on. Think about it. If a young person is on a track and life catches them sideways, something happens that catches them off guard and they get knocked off track, which happens, at least they have a track to get back onto. If I don't have a track, if I don't have a plan or a strategy and I get knocked, I'm not getting knocked off track. I'm just getting knocked and then I get knocked again and then everything's a knock and everything becomes catastrophized because I, I did I just make up a word? I may have. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because uh, you have to at least have a track to get back onto, right? Giving them a track to get back onto. Somewhere, somehow, a plan, a strategy, a track. Something is something bigger than yourself. Having a connection to something bigger than yourself. We talked about that, the contribution. Uh, uh, you know, if it's your family, if it's your faith, if it's your athletics, your academics, your art. Connection to something bigger than yourself. A, a higher power, a higher purpose, higher calling, right? And then someone is, hear this, super important. Again, going back to connection, which gives us hope. You have to have a significant connection to a non-parental, non-judgmental, caring adult. The non-parental piece is so important. When my son's uh, first cousin slash best friend slash grew up together, went to high school together, or went to school their whole lives together. Um, his closest cousin um, lost his life to a firearm uh, and took his own life with a firearm two years ago. I'm going to hug him and hold him as his daddy, but I know my son needs village. I knew he needed village and care from non-parental adults. As great as dad I think I am and as great as mom I think my kids have and the stepmom I think my kids have, I know they need village outside of uh, their three uh, amazing parents. You have to have significant connection to non-parental, non-judgmental caring adults. Somewhere, somehow, something, someone uh, are, are how young people thrive and learn to live above their circumstances. 
um, and that's what they're uh, able to access and, and develop. Uh, one of the many things they're able to access and develop through the Be Present Ohio campaign. Um, I gave you resources. Again, we have to learn to take care of ourselves in order to take care of the young people we work with. Um, they're pretty self-explanatory. I also have up here, um, because social media is such a big deal, I believe in the next 15, 20 years, this is my soapbox, cell, cell phones and social media will be a major public health uh, uh, issue. Unfortunately, we just got to see a lot more people die um, before it's addressed. So um, this is a guide on how to um, manage your cell phone and social media use for young people. We design for young people. Again, we, it can't, we can't, when it comes to cell phone and social media, we can't be telling them just say no. We saw just say no not work with uh, alcohol and other drugs, and it's not going to work with cell phones and social media. So in focusing on everything they shouldn't be doing, is shouldn't be our focus we also have to give them uh, things that they should be using cell phones and social media for so it's some things you should start doing some slowdowns and there are some things we should stop doing but thank you love you appreciate the work that you do it's so important <laughs>